Our special music this morning is May the Circle Be Unbroken with Molly. Will the circle be unbroken by and by, oh by and by? There's a better hope awaiting if we try, oh, if we try. I was singing, I was singing with my sister. If that doesn't get your blood going and wanting to get up and dance, I don't know what will. Thank you, Molly, for your wonderful gift of music. Um, uh, I just as you were singing that, I was imagining a choir full of Mollies all swaying back and forth at a revival or something. It was uh, pretty, pretty uh, amazing. So, for two years going on almost, or starting three, the world has been struggling to live with the great pandemic of COVID-19. We have seen many varied human responses to the pandemic during this time. Some of the responses have been very practical, some of them have been complicated, but all of them have created more work more stress, more anxiety, as people find creative solutions to try to reclaim a calm and upbeat attitude. As people of faith, we have struggled in our community trying to find the best, best mix of opportunities and services for the safest and um, most effective um, things that we can do with our resources. It hasn't been easy for anyone with all the disruptions and changes and moments when we thought we could get things would get easier and then they didn't or they changed. It's been quite an emotional roller coaster. And the challenge is that there doesn't appear to be an immediate end in sight. Physically, it has been demanding and spiritually with all this changing trying to figure out how to live with the inconvenient truth that lies in front of us, the pandemic. How do we remain hopeful and respond to this pandemic in ways that um, don't give in to fear or denial? Recently, in our UUSB meditation group, we've been exploring some of the basic principles of Buddhist psychology. And one of the lessons in the book, The Wise Heart by Jack Cornfield, Cornfield talks about how as human beings, we live in two dimensions or realms. The dimensional of forms, 
and in the dimension of the universal, which is spirit. In the realm of physical forms, everything is material and subject to the laws of nature, physics, and science as we know it. These are the hard facts of life, like living in bodies that are susceptible to getting ill and having to die. Bodies that need food and clothing and shelter to protect against the challenge of the environment. The physical realm is subject to these laws of nature and science. It is a level of existence that we often find very limiting and inconvenient. It's a world that requires us to pay attention to and appreciate the fragility of life. It is also about putting into perspective um, of putting ourselves in perspective compared to the whole. It says that our lives, each of our lives, is small and insignificant in the grand scheme of things. One of Jack Cornfield's teachers put it this way, the world of forms says we are nothing. In the universal dimension, things are a bit different. The universal realm is the realm of spirit, divinity, and love. This realm is not subject to the limitations of the world of forms. Instead, the universal realm is open, spacious, and free. Instead of saying that we are nothing or specks of dust, the universal domain says that we are part of the whole, and because of that, we are everything. Cornfield sums these two statements up in this way. The world of forms says we are nothing. The world of universals says that we are everything. And somewhere in the middle is where we live. I find this statement profound when it comes to understanding the world around us as we try to live in a world of pleasurable and unpleasant experiences, from excitement to suffering. Much of the suffering that we experience comes from our own creation and from competition and scarcity and isolation and loss. During the pandemic, my primary go-to when I am feeling overwhelmed or small or insignificant or deeply challenged by the way things are, is to go and sit on my meditation cushion. Meditation has been a skillful action that has uh, helped me um, find new energy when I'm feeling down. It helps me look for new um, ways to engage world challenges and the world of forms and to find new resources in the realm of possibility. Yet even then, there are times when that is not enough. I simply can't find enough time all the time to meditate on all the things that are weighing heavy on my heart. It is hard in the middle of sustained setbacks and loss of dearly beloved ones in our community. It is challenging to navigate this world that is rapidly changing and to be true to our principles of inherent worth and dignity for all people and our belief in a democratic process that is often much slower than we would like it to be. That is one of the reasons why I've continued to develop my meditation practice with the hope that becoming more skillful at helping to continue to see the big picture of things and not become entirely distracted by the details of the physical form of matter, even though those little things that happen are often very important. A couple of weeks ago, while I was traveling out to a week-long meditation retreat, I reflected on my meditation practice and how it relates to Unitarian Universalism and our faith. One of the significant parts of our faith is that it allows infinite room for people to explore the sacred and the holy on their own terms. 
Many faith traditions have contemplative practice that help guide people with a, uh, to a particular place with the Spirit. And as Unitarian Universalists, we tend to leave that, that decision of how to engage the sacred up to the individual. Making Unitarian Universalism, for some, a difficult religion to practice, simply because we don't spell out a course of action. This is true, especially in a world where so many things are vying for our attention. It seems like many spiritual practices that you use engage in um, are practices that come from other faith traditions, and I resemble that comment greatly. In reflecting on what we as you use might call unique spiritual practices, I am still thinking about this. In my mind, at least a few come to mind, attending worship, being active in community, and sharing in leadership in our congregations and in social justice work. But even then, I feel that shared leadership and social justice work are practices that can easily slip into the world of forms or practicality. In our reading earlier, Benjamin Hoff offered us a glimpse of how to engage the spirit or wisdom of the Tao and how that can significantly inform and improve our lives in the world of forms. This is the kind of support that helps one live in the world of impermanence and accept the oddness of the world without clinging to the known and the familiar. This is an area of reflection that I intend to engage in in a future worship service, but I don't wanna to go too far off my track. In a couple of weeks as a congregation, we will have the opportunity to expand our spirit's inner and outer workings as we move into a new form of Sunday morning worship. The days of worshiping only in the sanctuary have, are largely gone, and I think that we are all ready to have a break from Zoom. Am I right? Now, as our new AVS system is just about complete, and both the system and our technical personnel have undergone some testing, we now are getting ready to move into our newest form of worship that will be very different from what we have known. While there will be an in-person component in that new multi-platform service, it will come with many changes. In the world of forms, we are expecting that following the preparations for our in uh, person component, there are several things that will be significantly different, and I'm just going to highlight a couple of them. First of all, we're going to be asking people to show proof of vaccination, and you can check the e-news or you can check with um, the office about how we are doing that, um, but we want to make sure that everybody who is coming is uh, vaccinated and, um, and safe. People will be asked to wear a mask the entire time that they are in the building. You can bring your own. We are in the process of making sure that we have a supply of masks that are available here, um, but that will be a very different experience. Um, another thing that was probably going to be very different is that when you come and look for a place to sit in a sanctuary, we're gonna have ushers who are going to help you find a seat. You, we're gonna to try to give people as much freedom as they can to choose their seats, but because the way that we have set things up for social distancing, um, you might need to be escorted to a particular spot in the sanctuary if there's multiple people in your group so that you can maintain social distancing. We're also not going to be singing in the sanctuary, which is another very hard reality. And again, hopefully something that we'll be able to change um, as things get better. Though I think that um, at least uh, for that opening service, we're looking at having maybe some live music, just not vocal in the sanctuary. Um, the other thing that we're looking at and we have not decided on is um, asking people to pre-register for worship services. So. Um, we figured we could fit 70 people socially distanced in the sanctuary. 
Um, and so we think that that's enough, but we're still trying to figure those out. And a lot of these details are still being finalized. Um, we will utilize um, the new camera. For those who, who are not here in the sanctuary, we'll use our new system, uh, sound system and camera uh, to make the Zoom feel a little bit more like being here, even though it's not quite the same thing. Still, it does come with some limitations. For instance, we're not able to have people who are joining us on the phone share their joys or sorrows um, during the service. So we're going to have to find a work around, around that. All of these changes may feel strange at first. It's kind of like that pile of rocks at the end of the highway. They are our best response that we have been able to come up with so far to follow COVID safe guidelines, but also try to be able to offer a space of being able to come together safely. It is a work in process because it is something that is happening in the world of forms. And so it is subject to change and impermanence, but we will find a way forward. As we move into this new form of worship in two weeks, I hope that we can find ways to continue to engage our spiritual practice of patience, compassion, and love to help us learn and grow together. This will help us as we navigate the pandemic challenges, challenges with technology, and our human ability to cope with change. Hopefully we can rely on the energy of the spirit that can turn this into an adventure and a place of infinite opportunity instead of um, feeling rigid. I believe that we can do this and I think we can do it gracefully. It will provide us with the opportunity to continue to live our Unitarian Universalist values, knowing that whatever we do will be perfectly imperfect. In the meantime, I hope that you all find new ways to draw on the spirit that nourishes you and put your heart into a holy place as we engage in the sacred practice of our liberal religious tradition of learning, changing, and being responsible to the times in a way that cares for the greatest good. Thank you. Blessed be, and I can't wait to see you in two weeks and actually have some people to look at when I'm standing in the pulpit. I now invite you to join in singing our closing hymn, When Our Heart is in a Holy Place. Every
As we extinguish our Unitarian Universalist chalice flame, symbol of faith, hope, love, connection, and that holy place in our hearts that informs our work in the world, let us be reminded that although our time of worship has come to an end, our service to each other and to the world has just begun. Blessed be.